So um, I think this is our, maybe our third meeting, third 3D print meeting. Uh, Dave Baxter and uh, George Stallings uh, took took charge and helped us get this going. I think it's a really uh, cool little niche hobby. And, uh, you know, it brings groups of folks from Novak together. I thought that it would bring people like kind of close knit, but uh, <laughs> Chris has proven us wrong there. And as far away <laughs> as he is. I think that's terrific. Uh, and both Chris and Stefano, uh, um, I think you, I would say you, you leveraged a design that you found for a, for a motor drive or a mount drive and found ways to tweak it and produce something that, that is kind of cool. And, you know, this group is mostly about uh, what, what can we do with astronomy, 3D printer, printing, and, you know, how can we tweak designs and, and find cool little applications that you know, help us in our, in our pursuit of the hobby. So, uh, terrific. Uh, thank both you guys and, uh, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Paul. So I'll share a second my screen. I have a few slides just to have a line to follow. Let's see. Okay. Can you see this well? Yep, looks good. Okay, perfect. So hello everybody. Um I'll be talking about so first of all let me say that I'm pretty new to 3D printing. We've been working on this project before even having a 3D printer because we had access to a 3D printer at University of Maryland where we both work. And so we started making this design and just recently I got my first 3D printer. So I am not a super expert in the topic, but uh, nonetheless, we, we build this nice uh, object that I think can be useful also for other people. So let me tell you first of all how all this started. Uh, about a year ago, a little longer, we bought, we decided to buy a Dobsonian telescope and we started going around and in fields in Southern Maryland and, West, and, and Northern Virginia and trying to figure out a little bit how all this works. We got really into it and we started thinking, well, maybe we should take pictures as well. And we happen to have the SLRs, but we didn't really have a high budget being PhD students. So we wanted to have an easy go, an easy way to go to, to tracking. So we initially bought a mechanical tracker, the Omegon LX2, I don't know if you know that, it's like a simple mechanical tracker, which is a, basically a kitchen clock. And but we had some issues. I mean, you can it, it tracks pretty well, but still it's it's a little bit tricky to to use it. It can track only for an hour. So Chris made some research and he figured out that building a barn door mount would have been a nice thing to do because he was convinced that if we did it right, we could have tra um, get a good we could have gotten a good tracker for even longer times and longer exposures. And he ended up being right. So we started this, this idea and initially we didn't think about 3D printing in <clears throat> one. So we built it in, uh, in plywood and that was not a great idea in the sense that uh, it's a little bit tricky to cut it in the very precise way and obtain a very precise hinge and all these, these things that are very necessary if you wanna go for a little bit longer focal lengths. Uh, generally, those struggles from what I've seen are mostly used for 50 millimeters, why we wanted to go a little bit to two or 300 millimeters. So after that failure, instead of giving up, we decided to, well, just, let's just 3D print the whole thing. Let's try to design it from scratch using some models and let's make it that, that could like allows us allow us to have both a more precise tracking and also an easier to to build thing so this is mainly based on two so all of this was made in collaboration between me and chris and it is based mostly on two uh, sources which are these two the first one is the one where we really relied on and the second one is just what gave us the idea to to design and 3d print it and we stole a couple of ideas from the second one so this is the, the setup. So let me start saying what is a barn door mount. 
I'm sure all of you are very familiar with tracker with tracking, so I'm not gonna spend much time on that. Let me just tell you how this specific tracker works. So you have two panels and you have a, a attached by a hinge and the axis of this hinge must be parallel, parallel to the earth axis. And then you have two pivoting panels. On the bottom one, there is a stepper motor. On the top one, there is a captive nut. And the, uh, the rotation of the rods pushes the uh, upper panel up, opening at a constant velocity. And then we have a camera mount here with a, with a hole for a, um, sorry, with a hole for a um, scope finder or a finder scope. So here you can see here, it's basically what we need to do, which is we need to have this hinge axis very precisely aligned with earth axis, of course. And then we have the bottom panel anchor to this tripod and we have a stepper motor which is controlled by an Arduino. And the reason why it needs to be controlled in a specific way, I'll specify in a second why that's the case. But the idea is that the stepper motor rotates the least sphere that pushes up the top panel, as I show, showed before. And the pivoting panels are needed for this specific kind of part of man, which is called isosceles. So there are many different designs. This is, let's say, the second to easiest design that you can build, where those pivoting panels are always parallel to each other. And so while the border mount opens, they keep a triangle uh, as an isosceles triangle. Now, the top panel must rotate with an angular constant velocity, of course, because it just has to rotate with a sidereal uh, angular velocity. But the rotation of the rod is a linear motion. And so we need to convert the linear motion into an angular motion. and. Of course, that's a nonlinear relation because if you just, in other words, if you just take uh, the top panel and open one inch of the um, of the road at the beginning or at the end, that corresponds to different angles. So this means that we need an Arduino in order to control the motor and slow it down while the mount opens. So I have just a little bit of math here to to um, give an idea of how this works. This, this picture comes from the first reference that I, that I showed you. So L is the distance between the hinge and the center of the pivoting panel. R is the length of the road between the two panels. And theta is the angle of the opening of the bar door. Now, a little bit of simple trig trigonometry tells us that this R is given, so how much we have to open to, to how much rod do we have to have at any time between the two panels is given by the base times the sine of half of this angle. But what we really control is not this length. What we control is the rotations of the, of the rod. So we need to convert that length to rotations and they're just given by dividing by the pitch of the rod, which is basically one rotation, how much linear motion gives you. And then we have, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, Chris, I understand that. Uh, and please, I, I didn't say that, but feel, feel free to stop me at any point if you have any, want any clarification or want me to talk about something different or to or go deeper in something else. So you have these, this relationship between the rotations and the um, and distance between the two uh, pivoting panels. And then we have this angle, which will be given by uh, the time at which we are. So let's say that we track for an hour, this time will be one hour divided by the sidereal time. So the time of the rotation of the earth. Uh, multiplied by 360, which is just a full angle. So this way we can obtain the number of rotations that we need, uh, the total number of rotations that we need to open our uh, tracker for say an hour. So if this T is one hour, then this formula will give us the number of rotations that we need to open from zero to one hour. 
Now, the last thing that we have to do here is uh, what we really control with the Arduino is not the number of rotations, but is the number of steps of the motor. So we just have to convert the rotations into steps. I'm done with math, I'm sorry. And um, here there is all the electronics that is in this mount. So this is an, Ard an Arduino Uno um, clone, which is a very, uh, which is a cheaper version of the Arduino, but it's exactly the same thing. This one on the right is the stepper motor driver. So it's what basically connects the Arduino to the stepper motor. This is a stepper motor, which is the classical stepper motor that all of us have, have on our 3D printers. And this is just a box where we have two switches. switches. One is just on and off, and the other one is a three position switch to control the three possible uh, functions of the barn door that are listed here. So the first one is just fast forward to open it fast, then to close it fast when you're done or if you want to, to reframe. And then there is the tracking mode. So what the Arduino does in the tracking mode, it's simple. It just determines the position of the mount just by counting how many steps the motor did since the beginning. After that, it converts that to time and computes the total number of steps that you need to reach the right position after five seconds. So say that I started tracking an hour ago. The Arduino will read the position and that says, okay, I'm open at the angle corresponding to one hour. Then computes, okay, what angle do I want in five seconds from now? And converts that into steps of the motor and drives the motor for those five seconds. And then it does it again and again and again every five seconds. Now, this is nice for because apart than gives you the right angular velocity, velocity the important thing is that it corrects the tangential errors because when you're more open, the, the motor needs to slow down. And this fact that it checks every five seconds how many steps it has to do corrects for that error. And the second thing that it does is that it also corrects tracking errors in the sense that if I'm open, I don't know, 30, uh, an hour, say, but I should be open one hour and one second, the Arduino will figure it out and correct for that by speeding by speeding up a little bit, such that you track at the right speed for one hour and not one hour and two seconds. So this is a little bit of like feedback that allows to to correct the whole thing. Now, one thing that we still did not at all think about, but I think it might be cool to do and possible to do is to add um, guiding, because I think that it shouldn't be too complicated to connect a, a guide, the guide scope and have a feedback going back on the Arduino to control the speed. Of course, the problem is that we could control only the array and not the, the alt. OK, is there any question about this software or math about this thing? Otherwise, I can pass to the, to the actual design of the barn door. Did you guys make any modifications to the, um, you said you were kind of using stuff from that link. Did you find that you made any adaptations or anything? That... So, yeah, on the design a lot, the design is um, basically, it uses the same kind of mount, but it's redesigned completely. That was meant to be done in plywood and it was a little bit different. And we changed a lot. The, the, how the whole thing is is mounted, uh, and we designed from scratch the, the the whole mount. For the program we use, we started from that program. We made some small modifications to to have a three uh, three position switch and have some some um, uh, to to have a this feedback loop happening more often than the person that did that was supposed to wanted to do and also there was there is another thing that we did but then we didn't use which is to have this operation done by a computer instead of the arduino because it, this is a little bit heavy for an arduino so i wrote a program that 
send, sends this uh, data to a computer, makes the computer make the operation and sends it back to the Arduino. But just because it could have been better and faster and so avoid tracking errors or missing steps, but then it ended up being fine without using it, so we ended up not using it. Did you think about um, converting a, or calculating a lookup table uh, to use to help speed up the Arduino a little bit? You could have uh, actually, if you step back to the to the math for a second, mm -hmm. you probably could have with some work. You probably could have calculated a lookup table for the um, you know 180 over uh, the, the the sine of the 180 over sidereal time times t, and and used a you know use that value from a from a lookup table. But that yeah. may then again it may just have been easier to as you do you know send it off to a you know offload it to another processor. Yeah. Yeah. In that that was actually what the person suggested to do in case it was slow. The reason why I did not do it is first because I figured it was simple enough to build the other program and then use Python. Mm. Uh, and and second, because, and also I, I'm really not familiar with Arduino coding. So I just look at the program, learn more or less what's the language and did it. So I should have looked into it. It's something I still didn't do also because it ended up being fine just computing the sign on the Arduino. So also I didn't really one, spend much time on it. One um, note on this, the Arduino program size is uh, small. I think it's 32 kilobytes, maybe, or yeah, something the memory like that. is very small. It's, ah, it's like a few okay. kilobytes. So you cannot so probably you, store that. So yeah. there's probably I'm not no sure if the resolution it. is going to be enough. Yep. OK, there we go. Yeah. Also, I, because we, we can track for like four hours and a half. So it, it's a lot of. It's data. a lot of. A lot of yeah. data, yeah. And I assume it's the, it's the sign function that is too heavy for the Arduino. Yeah, that's what I read. And I suspect it's also true because like just hearing how the, the period at which the the motor slows there is the motor is not constant. It just sometimes just slightly slows down and then accelerates again. And I time that and that happens every five seconds, which is when it computes the sign. So I suspect that's the case. Um but I couldn't really see an effect of that on tracking. So I figured that it can be done better probably, but at this point also, we are still troubleshooting. The the, the whole thing is not completely ready, but um, it seems to be good enough. Making it work is impressive. So yeah, I'm, you know, I'm not being critical by any stretch of the imagination. No, no, no. I mean, all good stuff. criticism is very welcome <laughs> and suggestions. Anyway, thank you. Sure. Also, I I wasn't planning to show the Arduino code in the presentation, but if anyone wants to see it, feel free and I, I can share it. I can share the screen and show you a little bit how that works too. Um okay, let me show you a second the project. So the way I did that is my plane back to Italy, I learned how to use this pre-cut program, which I think it's a lot of fun and I really had no idea how many things you can do and I found it incredible. So let's focus for a second. Oh, I see that Paul has a raised hand. No, my bad, sorry. Oh, oh sorry. Um, so this is the, the design that we, we made. Let me just walk you quickly through everything so this is open this is the the one on the right is the uh, bottom panel the one on the left is the top panel and here there is a hole for a nut where you can then attach the mount for the tripod and this is the way we design the um, as you can see i learned how to use it but not that well um, how you de we designed the pivoting panels. So we did it a little bit more precisely than that um, 
model. We have also some holes for a backup plan that we didn't need to use, so I won't talk about it. But here there are just holes that go from the left to the right of these, and small holes here to to have uh, three for each side. We have three bearings. And then we put a metal shaft passing through this hole and ending in the third bearing, which is in the pivoting panel. And the same thing on the other side. This way we have the rotation of the panel exactly centered, very smooth because it's through six bearings basically, and it's perfectly centered with the with the middle of the panel. So that avoids any additional error. And the um, the same thing is done on the bottom panel for the, sorry, on the top panel for the other pivoting panel. Here is where the captive nut goes. While on this side, the, the motor uh, is mounted on the bottom. So here you attach the motor and there are screws to anchor the motor. Finally, there is a, a There is a hinge system, which is more or less similar to that. So let me hide for a second. Uh, let's see. These. Okay, let me hide the top panel. Okay, so this is the, just the bottom panel. And as you can see here, there are holes, larger holes for a bearing here and one on this other side. So there are four bearings on the bottom panel. And on the top panel, we have another two bearings. And the whole thing will be connected by a long shaft passing through all the six bearings. And also in that case, this way, everything is very well aligned and the motion is extremely smooth because it goes through several bearings. Uh, let me see. Okay, and finally, the last thing that we have is here on the, oh my God, I'm doing very bad with motion here. Okay, so here, this is the top panel, the one on the right. And we have these four holes where you can attach the, um, the camera mount with screws coming from the bottom here. We also prepared, a four holes to attach a finder scope eventually but in the end we decided to do something different which is shown here in this picture which is just preparing a hole inside the camera mount it itself to to put a polar finder there so this is how this is how know, did you have any any like challenges with the like the vertical holes are sometimes tricky. Any any print problems that you? We didn't very much. We had a little bit of them in the sense that when we printed them, the bottom of the holes most of the time was not perfect, perfectly round. So we filed it slightly, slightly to to make the hole. Also, before printing the whole thing, we we printed some small trials to see how much. Because when you print PLA, at least this is, as I said, I'm not very expert, but in my experience, when you print PLA and you want a very, very precise hole like this, and you want it precise because this way you can just stick in the, the bearing with pressure, the PLA a little bit just shrinks. So you need to give some more, uh, some, mm -hmm. a, a slightly bigger hole such that when it shrinks, it gets of the range of the right size. And so we made, like three or four trials just with holes to see how bigger it was. We figured out the percentage of shrinking more or less. And so we managed to do that. And then we just filed slightly the bottom of the hole when it was not perfectly round. Okay. So here is how it ended up being. I have another few pictures that I can show. So here you can see one of the two shafts of the bottom panel with a bearing, same on the top. This is the main hinge. Uh, I have a few more features of it. 
Oh, okay. This I guess that I have to exit. Sorry. Okay. So this is the the back of the hinge. Um, we also uh, printed some small um, washers just to make everything very tight. This is the bottom pivoting panel. So the motor is attached here with the four screws. There is a coupling and the lead screw. And top panel where there is the uh, captain nut inside. Now, just a, uh, first, is there any question about this project? Is it clear how? How it works. Basically, I can show you. Oh, that's pretty clever. The, I we don't take I don't take credit for the idea. I just take credit for this specific model <laughs> because uh, there were many. Oh no, it's not how you do it. Okay, anyway. What was the toughest part to print? And, and keep your precision because they, they um, seem to be pretty straightforward yeah it was not that hard uh, we didn't have particular particular issues with precision the only precision problem that we had was um was when we printed the whole thing and we attached the two panels we got a slight offset like Passing the shafts through and then closing the bar door, in the back we would be aligned, in the front would not be. So probably the holes were slightly just question of fraction of millimeters, probably. They were slightly misaligned, but it didn't create particular problems. So I guess that's that was probably the, the hardest thing. The rest of it was pretty pretty straightforward. We tried to make it as simple to print as possible. Jason, I see you raise a hand. Was it on purpose? I think you're muted still, Jason. There we go. Yeah, I'm, okay. still, I'm still trying to figure out this app. Um, so, yeah, uh, I couldn't see who was just asking about the, uh, uh, asking about any like print issues or anything like that. Um, just looking at it, there's, there's some things I could see that, um, like rigidity is probably not an issue uh, with as, as large as it is and using using enough perimeters and everything. But uh, especially with getting your holes, making sure your holes are perfectly round. And like you said, making sure that they're, um, like especially when you're printing holes that are standing up, uh, like you're going to put a bearing in or something that's going to be tolerance fit. Um, you can, an alternative is to flip it 90 degrees when you're printing it. So I, I realize on like on those plates, you'd end up with, on one plate, you end up with uh, part of the um, yeah part of the base there. The whole so basically the holes would be facing down. You would eliminate any sort of um, bridging issues um, of trying to trying to print the circular hole, and then you would also gain uh, a lot in rigidity um, by having your layer lines basically aligned. Think about I think about it like like wood grain. If you were to take that and print it standing up like that. Um, mm -hmm. Your circles would be perfectly round, and also your layer lines would give you a lot of added rigidity um, from it wanting to bow or anything like that. Um, the disadvantage, of course, is that you have to add supports uh, for, for the these. upper right. Well, if that's sitting, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the the base the base would be fine. Um, yeah, I guess the problem would be only um, remove the these. Right, because the problem if you wear, would be yeah, that so if you, you have to add supports, you'd have to add supports. Yeah. Um, yeah. Right, right, to support that when it's, when it's standing up. Which is, I mean, if you if you've got if you've got your your um, you know, your driver steps dialed in pretty well on the printer, um, like you don't you don't really have to need you don't have to like have dissolvable supports or anything. You can you know you can get some pretty good supports. Um, that eat yeah. that detach pretty easily from that, especially PLA. 
Um, yeah. But yeah, that would that would that would give you for your important holes like like where your where your um, shaft needs to go um, at the joint there, and then that would make sure that's perfectly round. Mm -hmm. um, you'd still have your holes that are that are going horizontally, uh, but those are probably a lot less important. I don't know if you are you. Yeah. Using, no. like, so we're not you using like heat prep inserts or anything like that in there, or you just no, because we're not using these. We're not using these, and we're not using these. These are just okay. backup plants in case we couldn't. Um, okay. Okay. The, the, the only ones that we're using are these, which are just hole for screws to to attach okay. the mount. Yeah, so that's that's even easier. Then I was gonna say if you were if you were using those, the kind of like the the oblonging that you can get from printing a hole standing up. Um, mm -hmm. would actually work to your advantage if you're going to use like a brass uh, brass insert, like a heat press insert, um, mm -hmm. which I'm a, a big fan of if you if the application can benefit from that. I see. So, that, that's a very good suggestion. If I have to print another one, I would probably do that. At the time, we didn't really, we, we were a little bit at the beginning, so we didn't figure that that could have been better. Sure, sure. Thanks a lot. So yeah, just... A word about settings. Um, so we use this Kiddy Tech One, which is, I think, a pretty old 3D printer that we had access to at the time when Chris was still here in Maryland. And the building plate we had was 220 by 140, so pretty small. So we just adapted our design to that. And we see, use simple PLA. We, we went for 50% cubic in field, just to have a very rigid result. Layer height, well, we put 0 0.2 millimeters. I'm sure that if you go for a smaller layer height, you would get more precise holes and everything. We didn't really need it. And also it was a lot of time. It took 50 hours to print the whole thing. It was like 18 hours per panel, plus um, I think five hours for the small panels and another three or four hours for the small, uh, for the camera mount. So, we wanted to limit a little bit the, the time, but it worked out just fine. Uh, so I showed you already these features. A couple of building tips in case people want to, I, I'd be of course happy to, to share everything and if you wanna try to print your own. And a couple of building pits, tips are to use solid bearings and metal shafts instead of using like 3D printed parts there because I think that's the only real way you have to obtain a completely smooth motion without any bending or anything. Filing and file everything extremely precisely, of course, is key because otherwise tracking will be immediately ruined. One very important thing that we struggled for months and we couldn't figure out what was our tracking problem was that we use a threader rod instead of a lead of a lead screw and that was a big mistake because the lead screws have the advantage that they are meant to avoid backlashing and since you're pushing something very heavy if you use a normal rod you don't notice it you can't say it by looking at it but what happens is that it just pushes a little bit down and goes a little bit down every time and you get a periodic error which we've had for a very long time, for two months, we couldn't figure out what was wrong. And then we just substituted the, the, the threaded rod with the lead screw and everything worked immediately. So this is a very important part to use a lead screw and not use a normal um, rod. Uh, oh, one thing I want to do that I still didn't do, since we cannot control the RA axis, and maybe you want to reframe after a while or something like that. Uh, you're on a track for more than four hours, it ends, you have to close and reframe. It would be useful to have a camera mount instead of being, because if you saw how, how the camera mount works now, this is the axis that is aligned to the, to the earth axis. So the camera mount is not when you rotate the ball head on the top, you don't rotate on the array axis, you rotate perpendicular to it. So it would be nice to have a camera mount that here mm -hmm. makes a 90 degree angle and comes out directly at you so that you can reframe just by, uh, by rotating the array axis of the ball head. It would be just easier, not necessary, but 
Also no. for polar alignment, I guess. Also for polar alignment, it would be useful. Even though for polar alignment, I was thinking I would probably use polar uh, with polar alignment. Uh, Chris means using a plate solving sharp cap or something like that. Like mm -hmm. rotating on the ninety degree axis would be on the array axis would be easier. Even though I would probably still do what we're doing now, which is opening completely the barn door and then close it completely again, because. Uh, we have no warranty that the camera mount would be perfectly aligned with the axis of the bar door. So probably to do plate solving parallel line, the best thing is to open completely the bar door and then close completely the bar door. Um, oh, and one thing that I, I just read somewhere, I don't remember well, um, about is to verify the constant speed just by putting a digital lever on the bar door having the bar door open completely for the four hours, transfer data to a PC and plot, and see if they, if you have the correct angular velocity. Still didn't do that. I used a very, I did a troubleshooting just yesterday night, and I used a much rougher method, which is see around three hours how, um, how much I start moved and just computing the, the, the speed error. So there's still a lot of troubleshooting. I think we're actually, it's not a lot anymore. After yesterday night session, we're pretty close. I can show you now a couple of shots before ending. Um, and this is just the beginning because my first 3D printer just arrived. So I will have a lot of uh, a nice toy to play with. This is the basic, the most basic possible 3D printer you can buy, but it's doing a pretty good job already. I printed a focus locker for my lens, and that was pretty nice. So I'll have a lot to play with. Okay. Before ending, I just want to show you a couple of shots. Just took two samples. This is a 60 seconds shot done with a barn door. And as you can see, there is no trailing at all. What was your uh, what was your setup then? Sephora? Sorry, oh. yeah, I, I should have mentioned that it is. We, I have a non modified DSLR. I have a Canon EOS. Uh, in the US, I guess, is called T two I. T two I, yes. What was your uh, like your focal length then? Or? Focal length is two hundred millimeters. It's just what? a it's just a lens, uh, Canon USM lens. And that was one minute. This is one minute, and good. these are two minutes, which is That's still impressive. perfectly round. Then what we did, what I did, that that was about, it was the end of November when I did this. Then I've been out for a month, so everything stopped. But uh, this was the end of November, and that night, what we did is to just try and, um, sorry try and shoot for an hour and we were uh, for an hour and a half and we were really impressed by the results because we shot shots for one minute and we got 94 light frames and we got 90 light frames that were more or less like this out of 94 and the result this is okay don't take this as a good uh, elaboration of course because this is just stacking with deep sky stacker Auto stretch by peaks inside. That's it. It's nothing more. And there is there was also due on the lens because it was just a test. So we're not being careful about it. But like in, in 94 minutes, we got 90 minutes of data, which is pretty impressive. Stars are perfectly round. There are not even darks and flats subtracted here. Um, so the result is pretty good. And yesterday night I did the last another troubleshooting. Try to get around clouds and wind and cold and everything. And we managed that, I managed to figure out that, um, well, I won't show you the picture because they're the same thing. I shot 80 seconds. And after this session, we did a small troubleshooting, adapting some parameters and things got already much better. And now I think that with yesterday night, probably we, we could be there and having a good tracking for all the four hours because the problem, when we did this troubleshooting, 
was that the first 90 minutes were good. And after 90 minutes where the nonlinear relation between the angle and the rod became important, uh, we were going too fast. So clearly we had a wrong parameter for the length of the base, which was a little tricky to measure because it's not perfectly aligned. So we did a troubleshooting, it got better. We got good three hours now. And with this last one, probably we should be ready to shoot at four hours. Given this two minutes shot, I have to verify the consistency of that because I've verified consistency only yesterday was 80 seconds and was pretty good. But I think we might be able to push far. In one minute, we got basically 100% acceptance on the life frames. So I guess we could push to even three minutes, which I think without getting a 200 millimeters and for self field tracker, it's pretty good. This is all I have. If anyone has questions, I'd be happy to, to stick around. I have also, I can also show the, the code if anyone is interested in that. So that's it. Thank you. I mean, I'm just blown away by the, by the, uh accuracy of what you've man, been able to achieve. I mean, that's the hardest part of taking that kind of a picture is the tracking and to, to put something together like you did is, I mean, super impressive. Um, now, do you think, I guess, just manufacturing, it's all about manufacturing and stuff like that, right? So if you built another one from what you know, just, just out of the box, do you think you'd get the same results or you think there's a lot of tweaking and filing and uh, you know <laughs> i've been asking my myself the same question um i honestly don't know it took a lot it was not that much filing honestly it was a little bit tricky to attach the pivoting panels but i think that's reproducible what i'm worried mostly about is that we use a pretty good 3d printer now we have a pretty cheap 3d printer but I guess if I fine tuned that well, probably would be possible. I still didn't try to print another one. I might try at some point just out of curiosity. Also, it's not that much material. It's about, um, how much was Chris? 600 grams total? Yeah, something like that. Yeah. About 120 each big panel, I think, mm -hmm. or something like that. So it's not a huge waste of material it would be nice to try and print another one maybe with some modification for example one nice thing to do would be to instead of attaching the rod directly on the motor would be to attach the motor to a small shaft that then moves the gear and put the nut on the gear on the bottom panel and just fix the rod on the top panel to avoid any vibration with the rotation of the rod that would be an easy an easy modification that that second link that I I showed you has that might also help. So I want to just to show you that this thing is not fake. So this it does actually work. So here you have the the Arduino inside this box. Now it's in tracking mode of course you can see it but if I go fast forward there it is there. Very good. The motion, which is pretty smooth. And so on. And then what? if I leave, it will keep tracking also from half of it because it keeps track of the- Where did you pick up the rod? Was that was that a- On Amazon. Just ordered it's, on Amazon. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's just a normal lead screw. We started, we used that to, Okay, I can't exactly remember how they're called, but less screws have either one or two of four starting point for each thread. We use a two starting point for it per, per thread. Uh, and that's also what helps uh, avoiding backlash, I think. But it's basically the same kind, it's the same motor, the same coupling and the same rod that I have on my 3D printer. And all this electronics is very cheap. Like the whole thing is probably less than $30. All in for 30 bucks. I was wondering what you might. Yeah, the Arduino is like 14. The driver is $5. The motor is $10 or $12. So, yeah, it's it's pretty cheap. And then there is a little bit of hardware, which are just 
five shafts, the bearing, the rod, and the nut. That's pretty much it. So yeah, it's the whole thing, if you exclude the 3D printer, is probably is probably less than eighty or ninety dollars to to build. What other ideas do you have? You're gonna work on this a little more or do you have another idea you're gonna I'd like to so unfortunately Chris and I are now separated. So our joint efforts, which were absolutely necessary to do this thing, uh, cannot work anymore too much in the sense that Chris moved away in Switzerland. But um but okay, so for sure I wanna make this work well. Just because the main goal of this thing was to shoot pictures, so I like to. Uh, so this is the first thing to to do for sure. And then I had two things in the back of my mind that I like to do at some point, but I'm a little scared by even trying. One is to do an actual equatorial mount. So with with a both an array and a declination axis with the camera mount on the declination axis, such that you can just even implement go to, and that'd be nice to do. I have an idea in mind of how to design it, but but I feel like that's gonna be much more tricky than this. Another nice thing that I like to do, but that probably I won't do, is um, is an equatorial platform for the Dobsonian telescope. Uh, I have a, like a 10 inches Dobson, and there are these equatorial platforms where you can just basically track for a couple of hours and it's half made of wood because of course it needs to be for for a dub but all the precision parts that need to be like the section of a of a circle with a plane and stuff like that that's all 3d printed um that'd be nice but that needs to be even much more precise because it's 1200 millimeters focal length um so that that's more tricky and also it has a one big drawback, which is if you change the latitude, um, you have to change the platform because you can't polar align it. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you, you can do some like feed and move a little bit. I, I've seen some things that can adapt for two or three degrees shifts, but not much more than that. And, um, and I mean, I'd be probably moving around for a while in academia. So I don't think I'm going to do that soon, but the, the equatorial mount after this is done, that might be next. That sounds great. Well, we're certainly going to uh, check up on you and see now the printer you showed us is now a new one for you. Is yeah, that that's my saying? actually first 3D printer that I bought in November because okay. we had access to a printer to a friend of Chris. So uh, when when Chris left, we didn't have a pr I didn't have a printer here anymore, so I, oh, I figured cool. I would get one for Thanksgiving. Now there's uh, George Stallings. He's part of this group too. He just got a printer. I, I don't know what he got, but he's he's been quite uh, um, you know printing quite a few things. You know you could touch mm -hmm. base with him, mm -hmm. and also uh, Bob Parks, our loaner scope guy. Yeah, um, he's an avid printer for all kinds of things. So. There's a couple of good resources out there for you. I think I'll learn from you, so I'm not sure I can help you too much, but. With uh, 3D printing, I really don't know anything. <laughs> <laughs> so Jason, on the, is there, an, is there another material that you think would be more, con, you know, better suited for, PLA is like easy to print with. I know ABS is a real difficult one, but I think it might be more stable dimensionally i'm not sure or um i mean if you were if you're leaving it outside during a if you're maybe if you're in a hot location doing like uh solar shooting maybe if heat was an issue but um honestly pla is is one of the most rigid materials that you can get besides i mean probably even more rigid than like polycarbonate um and i mean combine that with how easy it is to print i mean that's probably what i would opt for um, yeah. If all my PLA wasn't wasn't brittle and <laughs> sitting for so long, uh, but yeah, PLA is really ideal. Um, the cold temperatures, I don't think, 
Um, and I, I don't think it's going to make it any more brittle. Um, but it's, it's, it, it's really has the advantage of being one of the most rigid materials that you can print as well as being easy to print. So no, I think PLA is probably an ideal material for this. Yeah, we would we, 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 we print with uh, you using uh, PETG. You said um, that's a water, isn't that a water? Uh, not soluble, but uh, um, resistant. Or what? What is your purpose for using? Uh, P, so PETG is is uh, it's a little bit more heat resistant than than PLA. Um, if you printed something in PLA and put it in the dash of your car on a hot day, um, if it was warm enough, then it could. You could I mean, it could deform um, pretty easily. P, uh, P, uh, PTG would be would have a little bit higher resistance, not as much as ABS, um, but it's also not nearly as difficult to print as ABS. Uh, matter of fact, I don't even print ABS. I have one roll of ABS um, and that's and I haven't used it up. That's that's yeah. I, I just rarely ever use it. I use uh, ASA if I have to, if I need something that that's very, very similar to ABS and I would print ASA instead. Um, but most of the time pet G is, 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 um, it's not as rigid as, as, as PLA, um, but it's almost impervious to chemicals, um, as opposed to PLA, you can, uh, well, it's not, <laughs> um, which is also can be, again, can be used as one of the advantages of PLA is you can, you can weld it, um, using like alcohol, um, or acetone, um, kind of in the same way, same advantage with ABS where you can, you can weld it with with uh, uh, acetone or make like a like an ABS slurry using acetone and, and uh, um, melted ABS in there and then basically kind of paint it on and you've got a permanent fixture for the parts. But I mean, really, I've I've always found like CA glue is just as just as good and, and, and far more convenient um, for 3D printing stuff. Well, most most of the stuff that I use is um, well, almost always using P, uh, CA glue if I'm going to adhere to. Uh, pre 3D printing parts together. It's just quick and easy. Um, just the discoloration in some cases. Um, some glues discolor pretty bad, but that's another topic. Yeah. Cool. Now, Chris, are you uh, are you coming back, or this is it? You're you're happy where you are now. <laughs> the answer is I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so my initial plan was to move to Switzerland. This has been put on hold because of Omicron for like a couple of weeks. Um, I don't know, maybe in a couple of years I might come back in the DMV area, but it's not <laughs> certain. I don't know. And I've begun by that, so. <laughs> now, with, with, with no vaccine virtual now since COVID, you know, <laughs> membership, shoot, you guys can be members wherever you are. Exactly. That's true. It. it makes the loaner's coats a little challenging, but, you know. <laughs> well, guys, Stefano, I really I miss, appreciate that. Uh, yeah, Jason? Oh, I was, I was going to say I missed where, where Stefano's calling from. Uh, uh, where am I from? Yes. Oh, I'm from Italy. Uh, okay. I've, been, I've been around here for two years and a half, just like Chris. Oh. Okay. Uh, we were both PhD students. At, uh, okay. I just, I just came from, from Italy. Before we oh. before we moved here, we moved here in March. We lived in uh, uh, Fontana Freda, um, oh. about a half an hour half an hour or so above above Venice. Oh, nice. That's, why I, that's actually where I got my start because I lived five minutes from Prima Lucha Labs headquarters, and I got to go oh, down there yeah. and talk to Felipe all the time, pretty much every day after work. Nice. <laughs> that is awesome. I, I'm using one of the focusers from from Prima Lucha. That's crazy. I love their stuff. I just can't afford much of it. <laughs> yeah, the Eagle is pricey, but the Focuser is great. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, Stefano, thank you very much for uh, taking the time to thank you. do all the research and put a story together for us and, uh, and Chris as well. I mean, this is like, um, it's super impressive what you can do. I've always, I've always thought that there's a lot of things you can do with 3D printing in our hobby and, you know, I'm excited if I can print a two millimeter washer or a spacer, and here you are with a whole mechanical assembly. <laughs> you know, so it's. I recently it's, discovered uh, the existence of toothpaste squeezers that can be three D <laughs> printer. That's also very impressive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you ever need like a hat clip or or something <laughs> like that, yeah, I can help you out. <laughs> 
but uh, no, I, I really appreciate you uh, putting this together. It's great to have like a topic and to learn from others. Uh, there's a lot, there's a lot of tweaks and and things to learn in this hobby. Um, and uh, so it's great that that we were able to learn from you guys tonight. So stay at it and please, uh, please let us know what other projects you're working on. We'll, we'll have you back. Thanks a lot, Paul. And That's of course, cool. if anyone is interested in seeing the project, having the projects try to print, let me know. I can just send them over. That'd be awesome. Thanks, Chris. Very I'll let cool. you go back to bed. Stefano, Chris, thank you guys both. Thank Good you. Work. Okay, thanks everyone. Appreciate everyone's attendance and uh, and good questions. We'll talk to you later. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Bye. -bye.